All right. I'm Danny. I'm the National Sales Manager for Crusader Caravans, and I've been caravanning for quite a few decades. So um, uh, I've gone places where you really shouldn't go, and um, I've, I've learnt a lot along the way, but I'm going to have a chat today with three people, and the first of them here is Terence. And Terence uh, is the Managing Director of a company called Intelligent Engineering, but is a, uh, an engineer. And Terence has been around the industry doing lots of different stuff, and we'll talk about that shortly. But so what I'm talking about is not only off-grid, which most people will refer to as being something to do with electrics, but I'm talking about getting into those remote places first up um, and the checklist of things that we need. And uh, uh, the first one, I've got to say, that if it was me looking at it and I was looking to purchase a caravan, would be a very well insulated caravan because we are a country of extremes. And uh, we get extreme temperatures, both hot and cold. Um, so um, my advice to anyone looking to purchase a caravan is really good insulation is a great start. But uh, Terence, welcome. Thank you, Danny. Um, yes, it's great to be here, um, to be part of this initiative. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea to be able to share this sort of information with people to help them going forward, um, making decisions, very important decisions. Caravans are expensive items, and when you, you know, if you look at the way the market's running, um, in, in our industry, for example, we 90 to 95 percent of the chassis we build are actually all meant for pretty much off-grid, off-road, away from the beaten track. Um, um, so yeah, it, it's very few that we do for, for on-road. Um, so it's the market's definitely shifting, and with that, technology changes all the time. Um, so, yep. Oh, sorry, Terence. Um, I'd imagine that uh, not every caravan is capable of going to that real extreme off-road, back of Burke stuff. Um, would that be right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, uh, just, just firstly, um, just a little bit of background is um, I've been building chassis for a number of years, uh, probably since 2009, and I would say I've been involved in approximately 30 to 40,000 different chassis that I've uh, been involved in building. Um, I'm also uh, heavily involved in a company that manufactures uh, independent trailing arm suspension and also a company that does sway controls. Um, with, with regard to Danny's question, um, to answer your question, yes, Danny, chess is extremely important. Um, there's, there's, there's several aspects to making sure you have um, you know, the correct equipment. Uh, one, one would be the chassis itself, um, the actual material that you use in the chassis, the way it's built, the way it's engineered, the type of paint or, or, or protection that you put on it. Um, it's just a never-ending, honestly, never-ending rabbit, rabbit hole, and you just keep going and going and going, um, and it's a, it's a constant choice to, to make sure you provide the best possible you can for people out there. Um, the, other, the other important aspect are, are suspension, so that would be the actual trailing arm itself. Um, and then, you know, uh, if you take a trailing arm, and I'm not referring to airbag or coil spring, or I'm talking about trailing arm at this point, um, a trailing arm suspension is far better um, than, let's say, a roller rocker suspension, which has traditionally been used. Nothing wrong with roller rocker, but when you're going to off-road uh, uh, circumstances, independent trailing arms would work far superior because they could handle the indulations of the road a lot better than, let's say, something that's load sharing and both of them are ha you know handling the same impact at different times um yep so terence you're saying that something with a trailing arm is going to give your caravan a more cushioned ride to protect it absolutely especially in, in rough road condition especially in rough road condition um with with the way the market shifting as i've been explaining there's more and more people leading towards off-grid uh, 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 moving away from you know the normal the normal big four caravan park kind of camping, and um, going off road, so so that you have the suspension to cope with that. And I think with with a trailing arm, you are more than capable of uh, doing uh, the hundreds of thousands of kilometres travelling on a bitumen, tar roads, uh, and also you know uh, gazetted uh, off roads and 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 dirt roads. And I'd imagine with independence also would come the ability for your caravan to handle 
rough roads better. And when I talk about that, in Australia, I'm sure, folks, we've all seen those bitumen roads, there's a narrow strip down the middle, someone coming the other way, we've got to step off. Yes. I guess that, that independent suspension can yep. go along on the bumpy dirt road that's with, right. with one wheel on the bitumen. That's right. And, that, and that's where the advantage comes in. You know, um, each wheel is responding differently and to, to its condition at the time. Um, so, so the other things that are important, uh, uh, Danny, are, are the type of coil spring that you use. So you could have a steel coil spring or you could have an air spring, which is an airbag. Um, they both do the same thing. Um, so some of the things that Tough Ride do, um, we have uh, what's called energy mitigating technology. Um, it's something that's special to our, to our, to our company. And um, that, that basically talks about the position of the spring and how the energy is transferred into the chassis. So if you imagine the arm moving up, the, all that energy coming from the bottom of the arm or the wheel traveling through the suspension arm, through the trailing arm, heating up into the coil spring, traveling through into the chassis, that is, that is where the energy is transferred and that's the importance of this. So the softer you can have that ride, and again, softness is not always everything, but the softer you could have the ride, the better for your caravan, the better for the walls, for your furniture inside it, um, you know, your safety, driving, handling of the caravan, you know, just feeling a lot safer behind you, um, more stability. It's, it's amazing. Um, so a, a tough ride offer that. They, they do that, they have different rate spring, different coil rates. Um, so we go from, you know, a 14 millimeter spring to a 15 mil, 16, 17, 18, and we do airbags, different size airbags, so we rate the caravan and uh, we, we, we know what the rating is and put the correct um, uh, hardware into that suspension for you so that you can make the correct choice. Um, Danny, the other thing uh, is also a very, very critical or important in your question is, is the braking system. The braking system is um, you have uh, a drum brakes, electric drum brakes traditionally speaking. Um, which will use magnets and the moment you apply uh, from your brake controller um, the magnets will kick out into the into the drum and it'll uh, apply friction to the inside of the drum and and that'll slow you down you know mitigate the, the speed that you're doing and the other braking system is disc brake um, again being off grid being off grid um, you would probably air towards disc brake um, disc brake is, is far superior in terms of um, going through river crossings, dirt, mud, um, ease of use. Um, the, braking, the braking abilities of a disc brake are far superior to that of a drum brake. Um, I, would, I would guess, an accurate guess, that it has twice the efficiency of drum brake. It's literally that much better. Um, yeah. Terence, with the uh, uh, people seem to be going for these really big, heavy caravans now, and I guess disc brakes would do a substantially better job braking three and a half, four ton than yes. what a drum brake would do. Absolutely correct. So, so we offer braking systems all the way up to four point four ton, um, and and uh, Crusader, as you know, um, on the extreme vans, they they run those disc brakes. Um, and we even do, we even have uh, available an eight stud Dodge Ram 13 inch disc brake on a single axle uh, application, um, which, you know, which could be rated up to three to 3.2 ton, depending on, you know, on the wheels and the rims and so on. There's lots and lots of people on their premium product now, caravan manufacturers, are putting airbags on. Uh, what's the advantage of an airbag over a coil spring? So airbags, airbags have a number of um, options. Danny, maybe you can hit that, uh, uh, run the video in the background. Um, Sorry, uh, and I think, let's just have a look. It could be some, this is just background, background images. Um, I think we have some people here that have joined the Tico, Tico ride down at Canning Stock Route. And um, this is one of the, and I'll get into why airbags is so important. This is an amazing feat that was achieved by Tico Toughright, and in particular, one of the owners of the business, Kobe Swanepoel, who did an incredible job getting a caravan, a full-size caravan, all the way through the Canning Stock Route. Um, it's literally that big that we think we're going to apply for, um, you know, a Guinness Book of Records. I don't think it's ever been done before. 
um, where we've achieved from well 51 all the way back down. We did all of the wells and 1,800 kilometers of the worst possible conditions you could have um, was done with airbag suspension on a full-size caravan. That is proof and testament on its own that that is the correct system for your caravan. Along with that, there were supporting vehicles, uh, accompanying people that went along with that, also used tough rod suspensions, coil spring, and, and, I, and I believe there could have been another airbag system on there, I'm not sure. But there were supporting vehicles as well. All of them achieved the complete track and were successfully and, and made it through. Um, so the importance of airbag, Danny, is um, there's so many advantages. You have a softer ride to begin with. Um, if, you, if you imagine driving inside a car and you go over a, a railroad, you, in the vehicle you can actually feel that motion. You feel the bump as you, as you transfer over the, the railroad or the, or the indulation on the road. Um, but when the caravan goes over, you can actually also feel how softly it goes over. It's almost better than the vehicle. Um, the other advantage is, is it helps you with load, load loading on your caravan. So if you've overloaded on one side, you can put a little bit more pressure on the one side of the airbag and pick it up again. Um, you can uh, set your ride height so you can have lower ground clearance so that your, your, ride, is, your ride is more stable and, and uh, under control when you're, when you're towing the vehicle. Terence, uh, would the flip side of that be that when you're in conditions like this you could also raise it to give you more ground clearance? 100%. You can raise it, go through water crossings, you could uh, be, be at an embankment for example at the best spot at the best spot next to a river and the, and the ground could be at an angle and you could basically lift up the one side lower the other side and have a level caravan right next to the river so it's just a, 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 look those are just the camping advantages um, but i think the the energy mitigating uh, uh, transfer the energy coming from the sh from the actual suspension arm into the chassis those are your biggest advantages that's saving your caravan it's saving everything inside it for your big investment that you've built Doing, imagine doing corrugations, you know, thousands of kilometers of corrugations. That's why caravans and cars break in half. They literally break in half. Chassis break all the time. But when you have something like it, it just helps you, set you up for success. So that you, it gives you the ability to, to soften that ride. Going over uh, corrugations, you know, traditionally you'd air, you would air down your tires. It's still a good thing to do, even with airbags. Um, but it just helps you a little bit more with the airbags. You, you know, you can, you can probably get away with a lot more, um, you know, rougher roads. And tell me, um, all these off-road caravans, including Crusaders, we're all running these days uh, pivoting couplings. Um, do you think they're necessary or are they more the for good looks? The pivoting coupling is, is, is absolutely uh, a necessity. And number one, like if, you, if, you're, if you're in a, heaven forbid, that you're in a in a in a rollover accident, um, you know we, we pray that that doesn't happen. But if you were in a case like that, you would want the caravan to turn over, and that you can only achieve with a a, a, a coupling that can actually rotate 360 degrees. Um, if you have a traditional ball coupling, that won't happen. And some of them are really strong. And if you turn flip it over, it could actually throw the car over as well. So absolutely important that not only in off-road conditions that the caravan is moving in the right way, pivoting with the, the coupling, but also from a safety perspective. Um, it, there's uh, heaps of advantages. Do your research on a coupling. There's, there's quite a few of them out there. They range, uh, you know, all the way up to four and a half ton. There's different manufacturers, different brands. They're all, they're all pretty good. Just make sure you get a rated, uh, a, 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 you know, something with a, a swivel head coupling and that's rated and uh, suitable for Australian conditions. So in, in uh, finishing up here, we'd say that if we're looking at a checklist, we want a very well-built, well-designed chassis. Yes. That would be the number one. That's, I guess that's the foundation that the van's built on. Yeah. Especially if you want to go off-road. So especially if you want to go off-road, you want to have the chassis, you know, it's got to be really pull strong using you know, um, a, a good quality steel. We use Australian steel. We use 450 MPA. We don't use traditional 250 or 350 like some of the other guys do. Um, so we have a higher, a higher density steel, a higher strength steel. Um, it's also protected inside and outside. Um, if you're going to, you know, be near near the beach or near, you know, doing a lot of 
uh, coastal coastal sort of adventures, um, you would want as much protection on that as well. Strength in the chassis, incredibly important. The way it's engineered, um, where we come in at intelligent engineering um, and at Top Rod is we have many years of experience in this. And you know, as I've mentioned, I've built many, many, many thousands of chassis. So over time, you've, you've learned where things break, where things fail. Um, and we still learn today. Like we, we still make mistakes and today we still go on. And, but we're always improving and that's the main thing. Yeah. So a good chassis. Good chassis a good is important. good soft riding trailing uh, arm, trailing arm yep. suspension with either an airbag. An airbag, preferably airbag if you were going, uh, if you were going to do lots of corrugations, 100% preferably airbag. Um, a good braking system, you know, if you were doing dust, that, that sort of riding over there um, with drum brakes, you can do that, but it collects a lot of dust inside the drum, it catches it and, and could wear out your brake pads a lot better, whereas with the friction pads on it, this brake system, that's far superior because it wipes it, wipes it clean as it, as it goes. Um, it's also easier to maintain. It's lighter. Your unsprung mass, Danny, is in incredibly important. That's the weight of the suspension arm underneath the chassis. So in other words, the, the, the lighter the arm, the better it performs. So if you have a heavy, a heavy drum brake and you have a heavy coil spring and, or you have heavy leaf springs, whatever, those, are, those make the suspension very heavy, which makes your, your unsprung mass a lot more, which makes the performance a lot worse. So the lighter the unsprung mass, the better. Well, thanks for your time, Terence. We're going to now talk to um, Caravan Kev from Tucson. Yes. And, um, and guys, can, if can you want to... Have a, come have a chat with you about any yes. suspension, chassis issues, braking yes. issues? Have a look at the video on, on the sway control. And as soon as that's finished, pop around there. If you have any questions regarding uh, airbag, suspension, um, or just suspension in general, chassis, uh, tyres, that, that sort of thing related, please happy to talk to you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Terence. And um, Caravan Kev, where are you? Here he comes. So we're going to play a video first. This is up, the famous Caravan you, Kev. Which shows you how stability control works in a caravan. Um, in days gone by, if you had stability control on your caravan, they would say on dirt roads, turn it off. But like most things, Everything's improving, the world's changing. So we're going to play you this video to have a quick look at first. It's only a short video and then we'll, uh, I'll talk to Kevin we'll, and you might have some questions. When towing your caravan or trailer, having a sway control fitted provides a safer and relaxed towing experience. If you want the most effective device, don't drive past Asymmetric Sway Control by Tucson Australia. Tucson Sway Control is the only asymmetric caravan and trailer braking system available globally. And it is now available from the Tucson Australia accredited installer network. Why use Asymmetric Sway Control? Tucson Sway Control is the only device on the market with asymmetric technology. The asymmetric application of brakes is the most effective way to control sway in caravans and trailers. Leading car manufacturers implement asymmetric braking and driving assist systems as standard. Motor vehicle systems like stability control and ABS are based on asymmetric principles. This technology is now available for your caravan or trailer. With Tucson Asymmetric Sway Control, your caravan or trailer is proactively monitored 200 times per second, ready to take proactive control in a sway event. And if an event occurs, Tucson Sway Control will apply braking asymmetrically, slowing down the required wheels and effectively producing opposite torque to the caravan or trailer. The asymmetric action taken by the device will align the caravan or trailer quickly and safely without abrupt braking, which is usually associated with symmetric units. The bottom line is, Tucson Asymmetric Sway Control is proactive, effective and proven. The tests are in. Tucson Asymmetric Sway Control is proven to be the most effective way 
to alleviate caravan or trailer sway. Extreme tests highlighted the swift and safe action taken by the Tucson asymmetric sway control. Tucson RV brakes conducted tests with no control device. And it is pretty crazy at 50 miles an hour, so we try to get this sway in a crazy fashion. Now, this is almost drifting. We got, we got water tanks slide around. Whoa! <laughs> We have water water tanks, tanks were sliding yeah. around. Active truck assist device only. Oh, oh my God, it's violent. And the truck, 50 miles an hour, when I was doing my normal sway thing, I guess it thought I was in imminent danger because it almost locked the brakes up. It slowed us down 20 miles an hour quickly. But that was a scary situation when the truck tried to control sway. He mostly did it by stopping the truck in this fast, in very fast fashion. It would be terrible on ice. Active Tucson sway control device only. Now, with the trailer sway on and no uh, built in trailer sway on this truck, I mean, it's totally controllable. The trailer barely moved. It barely moved by me, it moved three feet. The other ones moved probably six feet. But now we're almost 50 miles an hour getting to the slickest part of the track. And the truck responds to me. I mean, I turn it. It goes and follows me before I was being pushed. Okay. Lefty? Right. Yeah, I'm okay. almost there. But the brakes are slowing you down, see? Yeah, the brakes are slowing me down. <laughs> now left and right steering. Not do it hard, yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't have to accelerate just to get this thing to do that. Yeah, it's totally helping me steer there. This is the one I've been waiting for. Truck stability and trailer stability. Right. Do they complement? And this is the question all the RV people are asking. Weight loaded at the rear, both. Tucson sway control and truck assist devices active. We have that 2200 pounds of water very back in the trailer, it's like a negative tongue weight as the engine bounces around. And that is, that's the part that really proves this works, is letting uh, the trailer sway control totally correct that pendulum we have back there. And it's very impressive when you get up there and things start swaying and it controls itself. And we've loaded this totally wrong. This is going to be bad if you load the trailer like this, but it actually controls that bad weight distributing we've done to this trailer. Kevin, welcome. Thank you very much, Danny. And um, that's pretty impressive. It's done in the America, obviously. I can tell by the way he talks. Yes, look, uh, that uh, gentleman there is um, Mr. Truck. He is a, uh, an independent tester uh, in the US. And uh, we asked him whether he'd like to do an independent test of our products to compare it with um, the various systems that are on the market. And uh, uh, for those interested, uh, before I forget, uh, over in the accessories hall, we're on in uh, stand 71, and we're more than happy to show you more about about the importance um, of uh, sway controls, and particularly uh, in the off-grid and off-road sure. area. And uh, two questions in one. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you call off-road? And um, secondly, can products like yours be retrofitted if these guys already have a caravan? Okay, well, I'll answer the, the second part first, that the answer is yes, as long as your uh, caravan has uh, electric uh, drum brakes, uh, we can retrofit them on any of the units. And the great thing about the product is that we don't care what you tow it with. Uh, in the area, and this, is a, this is a great question on, on what is off-road. I think from, um, in, in my personal experience, um, been travelling off-road around Australia for over 20 years. Um, I've done most of Australia. There's probably three roads I haven't done. Um, but I think the most important thing is that when we talk about off-road in the caravan industry, it's generally, we're talking about gazetted roads that are, are either sand, dirt, corrugated, gibber rock, and I will include in that non-gazetted roads like beaches. So the most important thing you've got to do is in my experience, and, and I, if I can cut across, if I see in the last um, maybe five years, uh, Danny, you'd know more than, than me, you know, five years ago, maybe seven, don't hold me to it, you know, 70% of all of the, the caravans were on road, now 70% and more are off road. And, and, and there's a reason for that, and I, um, I think uh, Terence uh, touched on it, is that in the 20 years I've been travelling around this country on mainly dirt roads, 
um, the biggest thing I see that, 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 that breaks is suspensions. And it's, it's worth your time. The most important thing I can gift I can give you is to know where you're going to go. And I don't know how many times I've seen the sad tales of people who buy a van saying, look, I'll never go off-road. I will never go off-road. And, um, you know, they'll be driving down the black stuff and they'll see a farm stop and it's only 14 kilometres. Oh, why don't we go and do that? And sadly because the suspension's not designed for it. And I know one particular case that I know the gentleman particularly well, when he opened up the door, uh, you know, the microwave was on the floor. And it's, you've really got to put the time in to understand about what you want to buy. So when it comes to off-road, please just think about Gazetta dirt roads, you know, and you know, like something like the Udnadatta or the um, Birdsville, um, the in in inland track from, say, Port Hedland down to Kalgoorlie, the Goldfields Road, Keen to cross. Um, that's what I call off road. Sure. And a sway event. What's a sway event? Look, in really, really simple terms, for those who haven't seen them on YouTube, those sorts of things, the science is, is generally is that the caravan, and I'll use caravan in this instance, is going faster than the tow vehicle. And it means it wants to overtake you. Right? And um, it can happen in a number of areas, and a number of things can cause it. It can be caused by, in some cases, wind. It can be caused by uh, trucks. Uh, it can be caused by you taking evasive action uh, when you're on the road. Um, and it's, it's, it, you know, we're not going to hide the fact that, that it, it can happen, but the most important thing is you can do something about it. And, and how does that vary between on the bitumen and on dirt? Well, y y you may think, but I, it, my, personally, my personal belief is that it's more important off-road than what it is on the road. And, and I say that because when you're on, when you're on, the, uh, on the bitumen, um, you've got generally solid surface and you're not coming across areas that where you're going to give, give and take. When you go on the, uh, you know, in, in a lot of the outback, um, the surface roads can change literally within kilometres, from, you know, from dirt to sand. And... Um, it's because the, the dirt, the sand, the gravel, the rocks have got more give, you're going to have more, the, the, the van is going to have more propensity to want to drift and your car as well. Um, and I, I'm sure that would, uh, I'll cover that more. And um, what, when we're talking about um, uh, touring off-road, um, what sort of things should we be aware of on our checklists? Look, I, I just want to reiterate what uh, the, the, the previous speaker said, um, is if there's one thing I've absolutely always made sure that I'm absolutely insane on is suspension. The suspension has to work. And by that I mean you've got to make sure that your, your springs and your coils are doing all the work and your caravan's having the comfort ride. Because when you get out on, off, you know, in the outback, uh, you know, on... on um, outback tracks, the biggest issues you have um, is, I'll go, I'll go south first, is um, uh, you've, you've got the different, different variants of roads and you'll have roads where you can be sitting on 40, the next minute you're sitting on 60 and then all of a sudden there'll be a, a, a corrugation or a dip and you're going to be swerving and you're going to be braking and it's most important that you know that your caravan is doing its work because it'll happen, and it, it and it happens where you you get onto a road where where you you'll, you you just absolutely think I'm, I'm sitting on 80. You look at the speed and think how good's the lease? I'm going to be to the camping spot early. We'll be able to set up early, and uh, all of a sudden the road changes that quickly. So down south, I, I tend to find that the the cameras of the road tend to be pretty reasonable. Um, you don't have a lot of issues that you get up north because up north, um, particularly on the dirt roads, the major roads that I call that are still dirt, um, they, the cameras are a lot different because in the wet season they've got to get rid of the water. So you'll find that you're, you're riding in the middle of the road and all of a sudden you'll have someone coming the other way and you've got to go off the side 
the canvas can be different, and particularly in corners. And I think you mentioned before about the black roads, you've got to go over into the dirt with one wheel. In, in the dirt and, and uh, you know, the, the, particularly the gibber, gibber rocks and corrugations, you've just got to be aware of that. Animals, the standards, emus, camels, um, kangaroos, wombats, they're probably your major ones, and, and particularly in, up at Red Hill Eagles. And uh, I guess uh, if we're trying to swerve to avoid one of these, um, that's potentially trouble with a caravan. It, 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 it can be a major thing, and it's, um, I'm not saying that Australia's um, beautiful wildlife um, are dumb. I'm just saying that sometimes they can present problems to you, and the road just changes, and I will absolutely guarantee you that at some stage you're going to have to make a, uh, uh, an evasive action on a dirt road and the last thing you'll be thinking about is what you're towing. Thank you for that, Kevin. And one, one final question. Um, many four-wheel drive manufacturers today um, are fitting uh, trailer anti-sway to their vehicles. Now, on the video we saw a bit about it, but maybe you could give us a quick rundown on should we have stability control on our caravan if we have uh, trailer anti-sway on our vehicle? Look, I, I think this is, an, is, is just an outstanding segue uh, into your own personal safety. Every, ca every, ma every car manufacturer on the planet that installs a uh, trailer braking system uses asymmetric system. And uh, basically what that means is that the, the, the car will break either the left or right side to control the sway and it will do it from the car and the laws of physics dictate that is the safest, fastest way to create or try and control a sway event. Now, um, the product that, we, that uh, we represent is asymmetric and it does exactly the same. The only difference is, is that inside your car it's waiting for a, 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 an incident to happen. It's waiting for your van to start to get a sway up before it kicks in. The, the asymmetric sway control that, that uh, we, we can provide to you is measuring your sway 200 times a second. And what it will do at predetermined, predetermined uh, measures, it will progressively put on your left or right brake, whether it needs a half a volt or one volt or three volt, depending on how fast you're going to make sure that your caravan stays behind your vehicle. So um, I, I strongly encourage everyone, if you think, if, if, if any van you buy um, from, whether it's in the old language, you know, 15 foot right up to 24 foot, think about your safety. It's the cheapest investment you're ever gonna put in your van. Uh, and I just, uh, please come and see us on 71 and we'll go through it with you. Thanks very much for that, Kev. Thank you very much, Danny, and thank you very much. And our audience. last person that we're going to talk to, our last expert, and you may have seen him up here a bit earlier, um, and it's Garth, sorry, it's Gareth. Gareth, I beg your pardon, um, from Arizona. Now, so we've been talking about a checklist of things we should have to get to those off the, off the beaten track spots. When we get there, obviously we need to caravan. And um, I'm sure that uh, lots and lots and lots of us have lots of questions about how much power do I need? How does it work? Um, I, I, myself, five years ago, I was a VIP, a very ignorant person that um, I keep learning. And um, uh, it's guys um, that are, guys like uh, companies like Arizon that are teaching us uh, how to survive better. And um, camping off grid used to mean, you know, a campfire to cook off, a campfire to uh, our light, and we'd open the, uh, the window to get some breeze going through. But uh, things have changed a lot, and um, uh, it seems now that caravans need, everyone wants enough power to power a small city. Um, How has the technology changed that allow us to do these things now? Well, um, there's a few things. Probably the, the most important difference is that the price of solar panels has come down dramatically. 
So it used to be maybe t 10, 15 years ago, an 80 watt solar panel would cost you sort of 500 to 1,000 um, dollars. So people will be running off a single one of those um, if they're living off the grid. Um, and now solar panels are, you know, 50 cents a watt um, in in some areas. Um, and so just the cost of putting solar on the roof has become so cheap that it's a no-brainer to put up as much as you can. Um, the panels are more efficient than they used to be as well, so they're smaller, so you can fit a more usable um, amount of power on your roof than you could before. Um, and then, of course, the, the change in batteries has been dramatic over the last 10 years as well. It's, it's about 10 years since lithium batteries started becoming available in that same format that a lead acid battery used to be in. Um, and the price of those used to be horrendous and now is very competitive compared to lead acid, almost the same in some scenarios. Um, and the advantage to that obviously is the, the density of, of the power, um, the weight and the reliability. So previously, if you had a caravan and you had a pair of lead acid AGM batteries, you'd be replacing those you know, every five years or every 500 cycles was the rule of thumb. Um, but if you'd, if you'd made a mistake, like you can, still can with your car battery, you leave your lights on overnight, you, just can, do, you can do that once and you're, and, and you're finished. Um, and the same, same with AGM um, batteries, you can flatten them once and you'll be up for a fair bit of money to replace them. Whereas lithium batteries don't really have that problem and they have built-in circuitry that prevents you from really flattening them anyway. We've seen on the news, well, I'm sure we've all seen it, where uh, a electric push bike or electric scooter is caught on fire. Is that a problem we have in our industry? Do, if I put lithium batteries in my caravan, am I at risk? Well, it's, um, lithium batteries is actually a pretty broad category. So um, there's lots of different types of lithium. Um, the type that you have in your phone is pretty different from what goes in a caravan. I, I'm not aware of anybody putting anything other than lithium ferrophosphate in caravans. And lithium ferrophosphate is a, a very stable technology. If you overcharge it, it's not really going to catch on fire in the way that your mobile phone or your, what was it, hoverboards? My nephews had hoverboards. Um, and I think their parents made them charge them in the garage uh, <laughs> um, because of all the, the problems that people were having. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it's, it's not really an issue. And we seem to want to run everything that we have in our homes, in our caravans today, uh, from coffee machines to um, induction cooktops to air conditioners. And we can now realistically do that off-grid? Yeah, you can. You just need to have a big enough system. Um, I was talking in my presentation earlier about what, what that means. It really means lots of solar. Um, it's pointless having a big battery bank if you don't have enough solar to replenish it each day. And uh, during the day, if you have a lot of solar, you're actually going to be running off the solar rather than running off the batteries. The energy doesn't go into the batteries and back out again. It just goes straight into it. So if you want to run all of this stuff, you've just got to put up as much solar as you can. Um, and p these days people also have like external panels that they plug in as well, which can be good because your panels on your caravan are flat against the, the roof of the caravan. And I've been dealing with solar panels for about 15 years, and even now I'm still surprised. If you take a, a panel in, you, in, in your hands and take it out into the sun, and you just change the angle a minute amount, and you look at the output on a meter, it changes really dramatically. So when it's flat, it's not really at 100%, um, unless you're somewhere where the sun is directly over the top. So these external panels, um, you can control the angle a lot more. But the short answer is, yes, you can run all that stuff with lots of panels. <laughs> Good stuff. And um, when people go to buy cars these days, there's electric cars. And uh, uh, a lot of the market is still staying away because people have range anxiety. Yeah. Do we get similar anxiety with a uh, lithium batteries in our caravan for, that are operating our fridge and our air conditioner and other things that we rely on today? Of course. And um, so the analogy that I use a lot of the time is that you can have a really big income, but if, you're not, if you don't have access to your bank balance, you can still overspend and go broke. 
Um, so it's the same with your energy system. You can have a lot of solar and a lot of batteries, but if you haven't got good monitoring, you're still going to make mistakes. Um, and so we use the Victron ecosystem, and that has really great integrated monitoring. The monitoring is made by Victron, and so it integrates with all of their components. It's not a third-party based monitoring system. That allows you to look at it on your phone. It has a screen inside the caravan, but it also sends all the data to the internet and can send you alarms by email and text message, I think, um, and also data logs so you can look at all the historical data as well. So that monitoring has really become a lot more sophisticated in recent years. Um, and that allows you to really track what's happening. If you think your batteries aren't holding charge or you think the system's not working how it should, you can ring us up um, and we can look at that data with you online and see, oh, well, look, you know, you actually didn't produce very much or you produced a lot but you used a lot or you produced but the batteries didn't hold it. So there's something, you know, and we can tell all that after the fact because it's saved all the information providing you have one of those systems. And tell me if I have a fantastic system, is it necessary that I carry a generator these days? It's, it's not really. Um, a generator really is, is optional. Um, when you're sizing these systems, you're trying to design them so that you don't need that. And you really already have a generator, which is your car. So your car has a DC to DC charger built into it. And that's, that's your backup generator, really. Um, you know, a genset would be more efficient and, and charge it up quicker. But a lot of caravan parks don't let you have them. And if your system is sized appropriately, you might run out today, but by tomorrow you're back to where you were before. Um, so most of the time, it's not, um, it's not needed. That's great. One last question. Do you have a checklist? If I want to run everything off my van, is there a checklist where I can, I'm purchasing a new van or I'm purchasing a new electrical system for it, that I can tick off that, yes, I've covered that one, I've got that one, I've got that one? Yeah, I would say it's most of the things that I've covered. So it would be, is solar as big as it could be? So, you know, when you're talking to somebody about the van, how much is up there? Have they filled every available space? Uh, are they, you know, efficient panels? Um, so we have our own, we use the InstaPower panels, which are our panels. Um, the, a large solar array and then a suitably sized battery to go with that. Um, monitoring and a DC to DC charger. I, I, I did a system quite recently for somebody where he bought a, a very expensive, very good quality 48 volt system um, and he opted not to get the DC to DC charger and I really spent a long time trying to convince him and eventually about halfway through the installation he changed his mind and had it put in because that's really, that's your backup. Um, and he, funnily enough, he already had a genset which is why he thought he didn't need it but then he started having problems with this very old genset that came with the van so he changed his mind. And so the DC to DC charger, that just allows the current from the car to get into the caravan battery? That's right, it's going to charge when you're driving. So, you know, if you're driving eight hours to the next beautiful spot. Um, that's, a, you know, your car's got all this excess energy that it's not doing anything with a lot of the time. And you can use that to charge your batteries. And so it's, that's a, if you haven't got that, that's a real waste because it's just going nowhere. Um, so that's, an, that's essential. The, the essential checklist is big solar, big batteries, monitoring, and DC to DC charger or alternator charger if it's easier to remember that, that way. Well, thank you for your time today, and uh, that's where we finish up today, folks, so we are on again tomorrow. But I think the thing that I've gathered out of this is if you're getting a new caravan or if you're modifying yours to be off-grid and to really get out where no-one else is, um, do your research, get everything set up right before you go, and I think uh, you'll get out there and you'll see this fantastic country of ours. But uh, thank you for your time today. This year's Victorian Caravan and Camping Super Show has more than ever. An adventure zone, the RV master stage, a kids zone, and the off-grid campground of the future. Let's get going. Melbourne Showgrounds, February 21 to 25. Tickets online. Start here, go anywhere.